Hey, what is good, YouTube? This is Who Was Like God. Welcome to the Sabbath service. We're going to be covering Daniel 2. And all Messianic and non-Messianic individuals are welcome. Because today we're going to be doing a non-presuppositional deep dive as part of our Messiah 2024 series. What that basically means is that on this platform, we're going to be looking into these different prophecies and just reading them as in what the text says. Not trying to read more into it. Uh, because I'm convinced of the Messiah, but just reading the texts and looking at what ancient Israelites who were the first audience thought about it based on their records and then go in all these processes to see Jesus, who was a real minister of the circumcision, if he honestly fulfilled these things in ways that can be observed without necessarily um, already believing in Christ or committing faith to him. All right. So from an Old Testament Hebraic a vindication perspective we're going to be looking at Daniel 2 so all are welcome as we engage with this text honestly and in righteousness before the Most High God so first let's understand this Daniel was a prophet and a man of God who was taken uh, among some other brothers to Babylon I say that because a lot of times you hear saints say we're in Babylon awaiting our future home or even in the New Testament in the book of Peter it talks about how we're in Babylon and we're writing our true home and you hear different people say, and I even say sometimes, well, Daniel was the prototype because Daniel was a literal uh, exile in a physical Babylon um, away from his true homeland in which God used him to give these oracles and these pronunciations, which we can see fulfilled in history. So with that being said, we're going to start in Daniel chapter 2 and actually read the prophecy of what the king saw and what Daniel is interpreting through the Holy Spirit. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this was the dream now we will tell the king its interpretation you o king the king of kings to whom god the heaven of heaven has given the kingdom the power the might and the glory and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of man the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the whole earth. So in those verses, I want to examine a couple parts of the prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar, or Babylon, is the head of gold, meaning in this prophet timetable, prophetic timetable, Babylon is the first kingdom. Two more kingdoms are predicted to come. One of them is inferior to Babylon, which is the next kingdom, of world history and after that as another kingdom um, which Daniel calls inferior to Babylon uh, which shall rule over the third the whole earth so now we're looking for two kingdoms in successive history the, uh, third, the second of which will have the power to rule over the whole earth so this is what the prophet spoke let's actually look at historical records and see what happens because the words are vindicated we have in history two successive kingdoms that follow Babylon that mirror the descriptions of Daniel. They're not called out by name here, but we can examine them from historical records and sources and see that the second kingdom inferior to Babylon would be the kingdom of Medo Persia, the Medes and the Persians, which would directly conquer Babylon, and following them would be the kingdom of Alexander the Great or the expanding kingdom of Greece. The Persians would directly conquer Babylon in the days of Belshazzar. So, right, we have um, what's alluded to in the book of Daniel, but other sources have since we can examine and see that the days of Babylon ended with the rise of Cyrus the Great of the Achaemenid em uh, Persian Empire. And that empire would see its downfall at the conquest of Alexander the Great, uh, respectfully. Now, all of these things can be seen in sources outside of the Bible. The interesting thing about Alexander the Great is after uh, he died, his kingdom split into four of his generals. And the thing about Alexander the Great is this. I don't really rock with him anymore. There was a time when I really would have liked Alexander the Great because at the end of the day, 
Um, he was a pagan, and there are rumors that he did some stuff that we would say pause for. If y'all catch my drift, he was kind of, you know, male on male, Alexander the Great. The Greeks were into some kind of weird stuff. All right. So I can't rock with that. But one thing that I like Alexander the Great that I always rock with is when he died and they asked him who his kingdom was going to go to. He said, to the strong. What? To the strongest. So allegedly, uh, when Alexander the Great was on his deathbed and they wanted to know who his successor was, he said, to the strongest. And then there was this huge bloody battle for power. Well, the long and short of it, we have four generals coming out with respective authority over the empire that Alexander the Great would have made being um, Ptolemy, Antigonus, Cassander, and Lysimachus. I'm probably butchering those names, but y'all don't necessarily need to know the pronunciation as opposed to the content. Alexander goes out the window, he passes away, and the kingdom he established is divided between four of his generals. So his kingdom was so big that he needed four generals um, to properly um, represent the different regions of it. And this corresponds to what some historians also to say that Alexander the Great's kingdom was the biggest kingdom to that point. So after Babylon, you have the Medes and the Persians. Then you have Alexander the Great, which was the biggest kingdom to that point, which fulfills Daniel's prediction about how the third kingdom in line would take over all of the earth. You know, so it is interesting because uh, some of Alexander's uh, campaigns would fill other scriptures, like how in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel says Tyre is going to get judged because they mocked the Israelites. And we can see Alexander uh, the Great fulfill that prophecy in really specific ways. So those are other ways which we can connect to see how Alexander the Great, um, while he was, you know, a questionable dude in some ways, was also intimately tied to the prophetic scriptures, both in Daniel and in Ezekiel, okay? So that is a conversation for another day. And I actually did do an episode probably about a year ago at this point where I actually went to that prophecy and how Alexander the Great fulfilled it. So if you want to know about more prophecies of the Most High, I uh, will have that link somewhere here. Okay, continuing out verse 40. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall still be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. So there's not going to be any more successions after God's kingdom is established. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the kingdom what shall be after this. This dream is certain and its interpretation sure. So this means that following Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece, there shall be a fourth kingdom that shall crush all of those that came before. The next world empiring the the next world empire following Greece would be the Roman Empire, established in 27 BC. They conquered the promised land by the time Christ and the apostles would show up, and we can actually see that Herod the Great who's mentioned in the New Testament, was actually a client king for Rome under Caesar Augustus. So by the time we get to the New Testament, we're thoroughly into Roman colonization of the promised land and of the children of Israel. So through the history of this Hellenization and this uh, first Greek and then Roman conquest, we can see how these foreign powers are conquering the territories that Israel once would have controlled itself in its kings and in the line of David. Now, the kingdom of Rome would both be extremely strong and divided internally. Again, the iron and the clay. I do have some thoughts about how that extends into the future. But since we're going on a non-presuppositional um, study, I'm not necessarily going to speak on that now, but just what immediately pertains to the immediate succession between Greece and Rome. Because we know from a number of sources, we're going to get to the ancient Hebrew sources, 
that corroborate that the fourth kingdom is actually Rome. So for these purposes of this video, we're going to leave it there. Here's the thing though, verse 34 gives the specific detail that the stone, which represents God kingdoms, comes and smashes the stone, um, the statue, right at its feet. You see what I'm saying? So God's kingdom is going to directly come in the days of the last kingdom, which would be, if we're going to keep the succession, the kingdom of Rome. Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and Rome. It's the Roman kingdom that the stone comes and smashes directly before the rest of the statue is also destroyed. You see what I'm saying? Now, this is the face value reading of the text when we compare just what it says most naturally in the context of the book of Daniel and the way it identifies the kingdoms in other places to just the face value succession of empires and world history. So what this means is we're able to get a clear window of God's kingdom and the timetable of when that's going to happen. And this is what I love about studying the prophecies of scripture is that if we're going to be honest uh, in many cases to what this text says, there are many time windows and timetables given that not everybody or every prophet falls into. So then when we're given time windows and timetables, the selection of candidates for the Messiah naturally gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then um, when we have a smaller number of candidates that also fill all the other oracles of the prophets, those odds get higher and higher that are being beaten. So after all of that, from a strong Old Testament firm Hebraic perspective, the one who fulfills all of these things, we can honestly vindicate as the Messiah, not just by what they did in their lifetime and afterward, but the specific windows that God gives for those things to occur. Okay, Here is where it gets interesting. The spiritual stone that ends the reigns of all the kings prior is unmistakably identified with the Messiah and the Messianic kingdom. Why? Well, we can look into Isaiah 9 verses 6 to 7. God promises to David that um, his son, the Messiah, who will be called the Messiah, is going to reign forever and ever and ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to accomplish this. So the idea of eternal kingdom, by the time Daniel would have been in Babylon or the time the second temple Israelites later on would have had these writings, most definitely would have been associated in the other prophets with the kingdom that God will bring in the Messiah. And we can see how the people who are descended from King David are actually exalted and sort of the messianic promise is sort of uh, revived when they're rebuilding the temple and people like Zerubbabel and Haggai. And I'll put the scripture reference on the screen so we can see that the line of David is given this calling of ruling eternally. And we can see how even after Israel's sin, there's still a, there's still like a lantern of hope that, that that's illuminating that promise. OK, so when we can look at the other scriptures and we see how the eternal kingdom is associated with what the Messiah's reign is going to bring for the children of Israel. When we have this eternal kingdom. In the book of Daniel, especially for the Israelites who are suffering um, in this window of time, um, from Daniel's time onward, it definitely would have had messianic implications. I think that's really self-evident. What does this all mean? Because now we're going to start getting deep and look at other sources. If Rome really was the fourth kingdom, we should expect the children of Israel in the first century to be looking ahead for the kingdom of the Messiah because they would have recognized that the fourth kingdom is here. Now that spiritual stone should be coming any minute. And this is actually exactly what we do see in the first century, in the time of Christ. Now, let me first start with Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian in the first century. He wrote many things, including the iniquity antiquities of the Jews, which is this comprehensive history of the children of Israel. And in that process, he actually has a section in book 10 where he talks about the prophet Daniel. And this is what he says. So this is a contemporary historian to um, the apostles of Christ in the first century. And this is what he has to say about the kingdom and um, uh, when the stone is going to happen. All right. So the Jew antiquities of the Jews book 10. Here he's sort of quoting Daniel, giving the interpretation. And, he, and this is what it reads. The head of gold denotes thee and the king of Babylon that have been before thee. But the two hands and arms signify this, that your government shall be dissolved by two kings. But another king that shall come from the west, armed with thrass, shall destroy that government. And another kingdom that shall be like unto iron shall put an end to the power of the former and shall have dominion over all the earth. An account of the nature of iron, which is stronger than that of gold, of silver, and of brass. Daniel, here's, here's, 
Peep this. Daniel did also declare the meaning of the stone to the king. But here's Josephus speaking. I do not think proper to relate it, since I have only undertaken to describe things past or things present, but not things that are future. Yet if anyone be so very desirous of knowing truth as not to waive such points of curiosity and cannot curb his inclination for understanding the uncertainties of futurity and whether they will happen or not, let him be diligent in reading the book of Daniel, which he will find among the sacred writings. This is so dope and so interesting because Josephus is recounting the history of his people. He is recounting the ministry of Daniel. And this is what he says when it comes to the spiritual stone. He says, yo, I'm all about history. I'm all about what's going on now. But I don't want to speak on what's going on in the future. If y'all want to peep game, y'all go read the book of Daniel. That's what he's saying, which means that Josephus sees the stone, which is representative of God's kingdom in the vision as coming in the future. So dad, Josephus in the first century, contemporary of the apostles would have seen um, that the uh, inauguration of God's kingdom as future. Why is that important? Because if he's looking forward to the stone and he doesn't want to talk about the stone because he doesn't want to speculate on things that are coming, the inverse of that means he would have seen the fourth empire as coming in the days of Rome. Especially we can see from Josephus that he uh, equates the um, kingdom after Babylon to Medo-Persia because he talks about the two kings and we know how the Persian Empire would have the Medes and the Persians. And after that, it talks about the king will come from the west. That matches up perfectly with Alexander the Great. So if Josephus is able to match up the kingdoms after Babylon and he's looking forward to when the stone comes, in the vision, the stone comes and hits the feet of iron and brass. So if he's looking forward to that day, it means he thinks that they're in the days of iron and brass, which in the context of the vision means he would think that they're in the days of the fourth kingdom. I'm so, I hope this isn't a little convoluted. If it is, then I encourage y'all to rewind because what this means is that this is a primary source from a historian that shows, gives us a glimpse that the children of Israel would have thought they were living in those days awaiting the time of the Messiah because again the Messiah comes and directly breaks the feet in the statue which means that he comes directly in the days of Rome verse 34 so if they're looking forward to that day then that means they recognize the time that they're living in and the time of the Roman oppressors and their mind should be ending soon because God's kingdom should be coming any minute the thing I want to bring you to is a Dead Sea Scroll called the War of the Messiah there are slight different translations that have to go into whether the Messiah is doing the piercing or the Messiah is pierced. For the sake of zeal and studying the scriptures and the other connections that are potentially to make, I'm gonna go with the pierced Messiah reading. Y'all can look this up, public information on Wikipedia. This is a Dead Sea Scroll from the time of Jesus. This is what it says. Isaiah the prophet, the thickest of the forest will be fell with an ax and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. A staff shall rise from the root of Jesse and a planting from his roots will bear fruit, the branch of David. They will enter into judgment with, and they will put to death the prince of the congregation, the branch of David, and with his woundings, and the high priest will command the slain of the kitten. The other translation says, and a priest of renown will command the slain of the kitten. Okay. Here's a commentary on what I just read. Most of his great deeds such as when after the final battle, the king of the Kittim or the Romans shall stand for judgment and the leader of the nation, the branch of David, shall have put him to death, are done in a military capacity. And even then, his role is rather limited. He never commands the spotlight in the apocalyptic narrative. Now what that basically means is that this Dead Sea Scroll has the Messiah coming and killing Caesar. The six-line fragment commonly referred to as the Pierce Messiah text is written in the Herodian script of the first half of the first century. So we have a consensus, it seems, about the dating of this text, and most people would be willing to bet that it came in the first half of the first century, which means between roughly 1 and 50 AD, between the year 1 and the year 50, we have this text, um which would have been right smack dab at the point when Rome had conquered Israel. Another thing, 
11Q14 describes the leader of the congregation, known from other Dead Sea Scrolls. References to Kittim refer to an opposing force, and scholars agree that it most likely refers to the Romans. So that means that, which when we study this and it corresponds to the time frame that would have been written in, it sees the enemies of God, of Zion, as the Kittim or as the Romans. Because given the time where this would have been written, most scholars identify the Kitsim, these enemies, as the Roman people. What this means is that we have more texts besides Josephus that see the ministry of the Messiah directly intersecting with the days of Caesar and with the kings of Rome. The ministry of the Messiah who's going to come and kill Caesar intersects directly with the Rome and the colonialization that the children of Israel are dealing with. So this is even more uh, that contemporary sources of the children of Israel through this time actually confirm that they saw the empire they were in, uh, the fourth kingdom, as the Roman Empire because they're looking forward to the Messiah and they see the kingdom of the Messiah coming in the days of Rome, both from a Josephus perspective and a Dead Sea Scroll perspective. What this means is that all signs scripturally, historically, and the perspective of the people living during the days of Rome a uh, point that it was Rome being the fourth kingdom. The final kingdom in the uh, Gentile powers before the kingdom of Zion is inaugurated. The conclusion I think is on its own merit, but it is worth mentioning because there are some people who try to reinterpret Daniel to, to get uh, Greece being the last kingdom. But that's a problem because in order to do that, you have to split the Medes and the Persians into two kingdoms. But that's not what the book of Daniel says. Book of Daniel 5.28, Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So when Babylon is about to lose its uh, rank in the book of Daniel, it says they're going to conquer by the Medes and the Persians. They're grouped together. Daniel 8.3, I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. So the powerful ram is conquered by this goat from the west, which would be Alexander the Great, as the text will also prove later on, because it has four horns that grow out, which would be the four generals. So it's Alexander the Great coming from the west that conquers the ram, and the uh, empire that Alexander conquered before him was the Persian Empire. So for the ram to have two horns, and one of them to actually be bigger than the other, reflects the Medes and the Persians, and that the Persian side was stronger. All this is to say... People try to reinterpret the prophecy so that Rome is in the last empire. But if you're going to be consistent with the rest of the book of Daniel, the Medes and the Persians are always grouped together, which means that puts us back on track to have it be Babylon, Medes and Persians together, Greece, which conquered the world, which means the last successive kingdom in world history, as matches, you know, world history in the outside the Bible, would have to be Rome. So you can't get away from that idea if we're going to be taking the whole message of the book of Daniel together. And if the book of Daniel really has Rome being the last kingdom, then it means irrefutably that it's in this window when the Messiah is supposed to show up. Here I'm, I'm giving a quote from Rabbi Abel, Abba Hillel Silver, who wrote a book called The History of Messianic Speculation in Israel. It's quoted in an article by Mark Eastman that I'll link in the description. Here's what he said. Prior to the first century, the messianic interest was not excessive. The first century, however, especially the generation before the destruction of the second temple, witnessed a remarkable outburst of messianic emotionalism. This is to be attributed, as we shall see, not to an intensification of Roman persecution, but to the prevalent belief induced by the popular chronology of that day that the age was on the threshold of the millennium. When Jesus came into Galilee, spreading the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. He was voicing the opinion universally held that the age of the kingdom of God was at hand. It was this chronological fact which inflamed the messianic hope rather than the Roman persecutions. Jesus appeared in, in front of the uh, proctorship of Pontius Pilate, 26 to 36. It seems likely, therefore, that in the minds of the people, the millennium must begin around the year 30 common era. Be it remembered that it is not the Messiah who brings about the millennium. 
It is the inevitable advent of the millennium, which carries along with it the Messiah and his appointed activities. So y'all, are y'all, are y'all people in game with this? What this means is that it's not that the Messiah would come and start the millennium. No, the Israelites thought that the millennium would come. And since the millennium is coming, well, that means the Messiah has got to be here soon, which corresponds greatly and exactly to the book of the prophet Daniel about how it's in the days of this specific kingdom, Roman Empire, that the stone was going to come and attack that kingdom first and then grow into a giant mountain, which is God's kingdom. Okay, so it's the days of Rome specifically because we know the children of Israel saw Rome as the kingdom. And we also know that they saw the millennium, the timeline, as what brings the Messiah. So all of this corresponds to what we've read in the prophet, that it's this window of time and this era that brings the Messiah in the minds of the children of Israel. And that era corresponds to the days of the fourth kingdom when God will suddenly show up. And here's the main conclusion, y'all. Because I'm inviting everyone here so we could all study the prophecy together as brothers and sisters. This is not about if you're a Christian or not. It's about if Daniel is really true based on the timeline he gives in the text and other ancient Hebrew sources as the first audience, which interpreted it um, to be Rome, which corresponds to the face value rendering of history and the succession of world uh, empires that we can just see in history. It's not about if you're Christian or not. It's about if Daniel is a legitimate prophet and um, really did receive these oracles from God when he put everything on the table, something, God's kingdom, had to happen in the days of Rome. The question is how do we interpret that and how do we reconcile that? But if the prophet is true, something had to happen in the days of Rome. I would argue also when we study the 70 weeks prophecy, which is probably, which is probably going to be the next prophetic video, um, that the Messiah would have to come in the decades before the year 70. Okay, so we see that the, the window just gets smaller and smaller and smaller for the individual who's supposed to do all these things to come and show up. So if you look at Jesus or Yeshua Bar Miriam, just like we might look at Simon Bar Kokhba, okay, we see two Israelites, two Jews, who are consistent with the law, and if we compare them just as historical figures, we can see Yeshua bar Miriam, Jesus son of Mary, who was born in the second temple period. He did things that contributed to the spiritual health of the children of Israel and the Gentile world, uh, things that we can tangibly de uh, deduce without even proclaiming faith in, in him. So from the perspective of being neutral, looking at ancient uh, Jewish figures, ancient Hebrew figures, just like we might look at Simon Bar Kokhba, we can look at Yeshua uh, Bar Miriam, this ancient Israelite, and we're able to deduce ways he improved the health of the Israelites and the Gentiles without even pledging a commitment of faith to him. And we can, and when we can understand how he did that um, within parameters that are increasingly small, a window that gets increasingly smaller and a pool of candidates that gets increasingly smaller, when we get to that smaller, smaller pool of candidates, and we have one who's fulfilling the oracles of the prophets within that pool of candidates to the T, then the only conclusion we can honestly have is that they are vindicated as the Messiah, not from a wishy-washy, well, I just believe, but from an Old Testament, firm Hebraic vindication perspective that holds the words of the prophets and their things in high regard. Now, when it comes to the health of Israel and the Gentile world, these things do are, are, are intrinsic to the inauguration of the kingdom, in my opinion. But those get into other prophecies, which is going to be the, the lens in which this series is continued, looking at Jesus did and the direct and indirect effects he would have on the Israelites um, in relationship to God and the law and the Gentile world in their relationship to the God of Zion. Um, that, that are intimately connected to the inauguration of the kingdom from other prophetic scriptures. For the purpose of this video, I encourage you to actually come back to it after you peep um, all the other videos that will be put in the playlist. Because what that will allow you to do is you can see the different prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Um, things that are both inside his control and outside of his control from the perspective of his ministry onward. And then when we come back to this video, we can see how he did all of that within a window of time that was outside of his control 
that he was born into, which excludes anyone beforehand or after. So when we have someone doing all these things within a specific window given by the prophets, then they are vindicated when they do what the prophets said are going to be done when they said it was going to happen by. See, the main point is this, is that God's word is so meticulous that we can look at all the centuries of history and just compare things rigidly to the Old Testament um, uh, from a high respect of the Hebrew prophets and be able to discern who really was a vessel of God in the centuries following when the prophets gave their oracles. And from that perspective, we can see how Yeshua bar Miriam, Jesus son of Mary, really was this figure who did all of these things in the same way we might look at Simon bar Kokhba and the historical context surrounding him. We could look at the historical context of Yeshua, son of Mary, and see how he is vindicated um, in that role of the Messiah. So my, my, my sincere uh, appeal to you is to honestly just take some time and pray to the Lord for the truth and to uh, just, just meditate on this video. Uh, I do plan to make more videos in this series where I go in depth about a bunch of other prophecies from a non-presuppositional angle. And I just ask you to um, continue and watch the playlist if you're skeptical or if you don't believe that Yeshua, Jesus, was the Messiah. That's my honest, my honest uh, uh, desire and, and challenge to you is to continue to watch the playlist if you're skeptical, if you're skeptical of Christ, because I understand I'm challenging your beliefs. But pray to the God, pray to the Most High that He'll lead you into truth, because it's not about what you come in believing. It's about looking at the text and saying, "Yo, if Daniel, it's not about." how I interpret it. If Daniel was a real and legitimate prophet that God spoke to, something happened to, needed to happen in the days of Rome. And there's one figure that stands out from all the West who says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Letting the tribes know that the kingdom has come. So if y'all are interested, y'all be blessed in the Most High. And even if you're not, y'all be blessed in the Most High. Y'all be blessed in the Messiah, those who recognize him. And I'll see you in the next video, all right? Peace.